In this video, I'll show you how to calculate how many wafers AMD has used for the PS5 processor. What's your minimum specification? This video is possible by the patrons, patreon.com slash techtechpotato. Thank you all. In this video today, we're going to go through the data needed to be able to predict how many wafers AMD has used at TSMC for uh, Sony's PlayStation 5. I'm going to show you the data we have and wrap it together in how to calculate these sorts of numbers. This stems from a tweet that I posted just a few days ago, where I explain that based on the die size of the processor, based on the physical defect rate of TSMC's N7 process, and based on how many PlayStation 5s that have been sold, we can get a rough estimate for how many wafers have currently been in production. And then we can also link that to how many uh, wafers TSMC is currently producing on its various processes. So first, the tweet. So this is the tweet I made. Uh, it says, sorry, I'm an idiot and got the die size wrong. New numbers. With a 308 mm squared die, 22 mm by 40 mm, and TSMC's 0.09 per centimeter squared defect rate for 7 nanometer, there's 137 defect, defect free die per wafer. Or at 7.8 million console CPUs, uh, it's a bit wrong here, but uh, 56,934 wafers. This will come through from the fact that uh, The Verge has reported that Sony has been selling 7.8 million PlayStation 5 consoles. Now we know each console has one AMD APU inside. So let's go through the math, as it were. Let's start off with the die size. Now, die size for PlayStation 5 for uh, APU, it's a CPU plus GPU combined on the same 7 nanometer processor. It's 308 square millimeters. Unfortunately, this isn't enough information simply just to get the numbers that we have. We have to look into exactly the dimensions in X and Y for the processor. Now, with these fun sort of APUs, it can be difficult to get these numbers. People are more concentrated on the just the overall die size as an area rather than dimensions in the X and Y. So for here, we go over to Twitter and at underscore row game has an image of the uh, Sony PS5 APU and using the dimensions of a GDDR5 uh, chip on the board. Here, he's put down that we have 308 square millimeters, but the, I think the important thing here is the numbers. We can use these pixel numbers, 233 and 272, along with the 256 and 454 of the PS5 to actually get the numbers. So here we take if we take 256 pixels, we divide it by 233. This should be the short side. So this should we multiply that by 12 millimeters and we get 13.18 millimeters. If we go back and take uh, the other side now, we have 272 pixels. That is the 14 millimeters. And we do use ratios again to get 454 pixels to come out as 23.367 millimeters for the long side. Now, if we do 23.367 multiplied by 13.184, we get the 308 square millimeters um, that uh, was previously reported. Now, in order to move from this to actual numbers of dies and dies per wafer, we go to a die per wafer calculator. And the one most commonly used is the one from Cali Technologies, a die per wafer calculator. And in this number, we look at uh, die size, uh, yields, it tells you uh, no defects, known good dies, uh, possible bad dies, and definitely dies you can't use. So we're going to put in the numbers into uh, this calculator. 23.367 millimeters for width, 13.184 millimeters for height. Uh, leave scribe lanes and vertical scribe lanes, that's kind of like the distance between different dies. Then we have wafer diameter. Now this is normally set at 100 uh, millimeters, 4 inch wafers by default. We want to move to 12 inch wafers because 7 nanometers is a 12 inch process. Edge loss in millimeters is the difference between this red and this green line. Just you can't go too far to the edge of a wafer um, because of flexibility and such. Now defect density is the other key component here. I've put it down as 0.09. That's because TSMC has previously published that its uh, 7 nanometer process has a defect rate of 0.09 per square centimeter. Now, what this means by defect is essentially um, wires that shouldn't be crossing. It's causing a short on the chip. 
um, either a core is disabled or a GPU core is disabled, we'll get why that the defect yield is different from the actual endpoint yield in just a second. But if we put all these numbers in uh, to this, we get this um, graph here. I'll move myself over, where it shows that for the for the die, for the uh, defect density of 0.09 square centimeters, 0.09 per square centimeter, with this die size, we have a yield of 76.27%. Now the die is automatically moved in the x y dimension to get the most um, the most chips out. So the greens here are dies that are defect free it uses um you know stochastic random noise to determine how many defects the wafer should have and cuts out those those dies the partial dies here are the ones who go in between this sort of edge loss zone so if we move the edge loss to two millimeters we'd get more good dies um, but five is pretty standard and what we see here is we have out of all the dies per wafer, so 172 down the bottom here. We have 131 good dies and 14 partial dies and 41 defective dies. And um, a wafer this size with a defect density of 0.09 per square centimeter, you're gonna get 41, 42 defects per wafer. And this is borne out in here. So the number we really want here is uh, good dies 131. If AMD or TSMC, Sony were pushing the boat, we could probably also add these 14 dies. Taking those numbers, the 131 per wafer, we go back to 7.8 million PlayStation 5 consoles. So we can put 7.8 million divided by 131. And it gives 59,541 wafers. Uh, this is using a more accurate um, X and Y uh, die dimensions than I used in my tweet, but we're still looking here about 60,000 wafers. This is purely yield based on defects. There are two main areas where the defect yield may not be the actual yield. So what do we mean by yielding chip in this instance? We're looking at a chip that is usable inside a system. So a usable chip can still have a defect. This means that the chip is built for to absorb defects. So in the case of Sony's APU, it has more graphics compute units than is actually used. I think the number is uh, 48 out of 52 or something similar. So it can, it can handle defects in the GPU and still use that chip in a console. So this would actually raise the effective yield by building redundancy into the chip. And part of chip design is doing just that, building redundancy, especially when you're on the leading edge process nodes that have the higher defect density rate. So at 0.09 per square centimeter, TSMC has said that it's seven nanometer and it's five nanometer processes are about the same defect density now. Chip designers take that in mind when they're building for a process. Now, there is one element of uh, yield which could decrease your effective yield and that's binning. So chips, when you design them, they don't all come out with the same voltage frequency curves. If you've ever wondered why Intel has you know, 30 different SKUs in its stack and they all vary by 100 megahertz, it's because some processors have a better voltage frequency response than others. And that's that just down to the random stochastic nature of how it's designed. If you think you're kind of printing a wire inside one of these wafers, uh, sometimes that wire can have fuzzy edges, for example, depending on how accurate your lithography process tools are. And that can instigate variation. And if you're on a critical path, it can uh, either help frequency or reduce frequency. So we have binning. Now, some of these processors that either do have defects or don't have defects, they may not bin to the required frequency or voltage or power window. So these would actually be taken out of the die calculation, out of the yield calculation, and then out of the wafer calculation. Typically, when we talk about yield in a general context we're normally talking about the uh, defect free yield that is not the true net yield because of these um, designs to absorb defects or when binning uh, means that you don't have enough frequency or voltage with consoles it's a bit different on the binning side because you have to meet a minimum voltage frequency and power standard um, to ship the console with uh, desktop PCs, with server processors. It's different because they have different different SKUs and different bins. When it comes to mobile processors, it depends on who's making the processor. Something like Apple has to be very concrete in their frequency and uh, voltage. Something like MediaTek, who sells chips to a dozen companies, 
they create a dozen SKUs based on binning and then can hand out some of those um, SKUs as and when required. When a company like Apple or a company like AMD, a company like Sony uh, buying from AMD, when they design their processor and they say, okay, we want a, you know, say three gigahertz uh, frequency, they look at the yield curve and see, well, how many of those processors reach three gigahertz, for example. And the idea is that it's a very high number because when you're dealing with 7.8 million chips for Sony or whether it's, you know, millions and millions of uh, iPhone uh, processors, then every kind of 1% yield, every chip per wafer matters because those wafers, you know, cost seven, eight, ten. $12,000 depending on you know how much AMD or Apple have paid for them. Defect yield is still a good stake in the sand as a kind of context for how many wafers are being used. Now TSMC has capacity to build about 120 to 150,000 7 nanometer wafers per month so the fact that Sony has used 60,000 uh, in what six eight months of production is only about 10,000 wafers per month so are they using a lot of TSMC's uh, output? Yeah, it's a good amount. And obviously AMD has to budget for that in order to be able to provide. But things like the Xbox, things like uh, Ryzen, things like Epic, these are all taking you know thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of wafers per month as well. So TSMC will never break down how many customers it has on any given process node. On 7 nanometer, I think they now have uh, probably about 100 customers on 7 nanometer. And then 5 nanometer, you know, we're looking at, you know, Apple and what, high silicon. Interesting topic on how exactly to get wafers based on die size and defect density. Ideally, minimum specification here would be zero defects at all and everything bins really high. Um, physics doesn't do that, though there's plenty of research out there in order to minimize the effects of physics. Um, if you ever watch the Star Trek episode where you can't break the laws of physics, but you can bend them, this is exactly what we're doing with lithography today.